your screen. So welcome everyone. We are starting the webinar now for Solar for Businesses in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, this is about commercial and industrial solar. So when you hear someone say C and I, that's what they're talking about. Uh, I'll do a little, a few introductions before we get we dive into the webinar. Uh, this webinar was sponsored by Responsibility and the Global Climate Partnership Fund. Responsibility is an asset manager in the field of development and investments and offers professionally managed investment solutions to private, institutional, and public investors. Uh, Responsibility uh, decided to sponsor this report with Bloomberg New Energy Finance, Bloomberg NEF, uh, mainly because they wanted to start a new fund and they realized that there was not a lot of data out there in this space. So that's why this report um, was launched. It's really one of a kind in that way. Uh, the other sponsor is the Global Climate Partnership Fund, and this is an innovative public-private partnership that uses public funding to leverage private capital in order to mitigate climate change. Uh, and if you want to find out more about any of these, you can look to the right-hand side of your screen and you'll see a website link to Responsibility, to the Global Climate Partnership Fund, to Bloomberg New Energy Finance, and to the Green Lending Forum, which is part of the Global Climate Partnership Fund. So now a little bit of housekeeping. You can also look to the right side of your screen and see that the, the report itself is there to be downloaded. And everything that you'll see on the slides today is in the report. So um, we don't have the slides over there as well. Uh, and it's exclusive. It literally just came out today. So you're the, some of the first people to get it. Another note is that everyone is muted. So if you ever have a question, just go to the right hand side of your screen and in the chat and type in a question at any time. And then at the very end of the webinar, uh, after about 30 minutes or so, we'll, we'll go straight into Q&A and give a lot of time uh, for all of your questions. Uh, so now, uh, before we get started, I'm gonna launch a poll and just to kind of test the waters and see uh, where you guys are at. So here it comes. Please pick what answer you think is uh, how you feel, and then we'll go on from there and start the webinar. All right, people are dialing in here. I'll give it just a few more seconds, and then I'll pass over to Itamar. All right, in five, four, three, two, one, I'm closing the poll, and now I will share the results and hand over to Itamar, who's gonna introduce our panelists today. Itamar, over to you. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Stacy, for this kind introduction and welcome to the audience. Um, as Stacy said, the topic of today's talk is commercial and industrial solar in sub-Saharan Africa. Now, that's a market that really only just started to kick off in the last two years. Um, and based on our analysis here from Bloomberg and EF, we think that could actually double again just this year alone, admittedly from a very low base. Now, before we dive into the details of the commercial and industrial solar market, I wanted to just step out a little bit and look at the solar market in Sub-Saharan Africa uh, and specifically outside of South Africa in a, little more, in a little more detail. Now, with an immense energy deficit and a lot of sunshine, in theory, Sub-Saharan Africa could be fertile ground for solar. But despite those fundamentals, there's only about half a gigawatt of solar capacity installed in those markets. Now, just to give you some perspective, that's less than half a percent of the global solar market just last year alone. Now, if you dive deeper into, those, into, the, into the data, what you see on the slide is really that out of the 420 megawatt that are being installed and are currently selling electricity to the grid, um, about 174 have actually been built either on islands, on a few small islands off the continent, or with support from the World Bank Scaling Solar Program, so with, with financing through that program. Out of the rest, a lot of it has actually been built in just two countries uh, with very, very small populations. So why is that important? If you look at the rest then, um, the other 246 megawatt, for every 
for every four megawatt of those, there's roughly one megawatt of commercial and industrial solar. Um, and as I said, that has, that has mostly been installed in just the last two years. So that is growing a lot faster at the moment. Now, quick word of definition. When we talk about commercial and industrial solar, what is that? Now, you'll shortly see in the next slide a picture, you know, CNI solar, really what we mean um, is not a question of size. We were seeing projects from a few kilowatts all the way to several megawatts um, or, or potentially even tens of megawatts. Um, the definition is really that the output of the, the, of the solar panels is being sold directly to end consumers of electricity. Usually those projects are installed on the site of the, the consumption or very nearby, um, and as I said, serve consumers directly. In this particular region here in Sub-Saharan Africa, actually, what we'll see, they'll usually, they're, they're usually designed in a way that all the electricity is consumed on site. Now, as I said, that market has really just kicked off in the last two years and represents, depending on how you count, about 24% of the market in Sub-Saharan Africa. That, raises some interesting questions. Um, why is that and is there potential for more? Um, thankfully, our friends at Responsibility um, have agreed that those are interesting questions. Um, and over the past few months, um, we at Bloomberg NEF have worked on a research project trying to identify the market and, and really map out what is going on. We started with a desk study of 15 countries that we ranked um, based on three primary criteria. First of all, what are the economics for commercial and industrial solar? That's primarily comparing the cost estimate of that to the local grid tariffs. We also looked at the regulatory framework and what is feasible, as well as at market momentum. So how fast are renewable energy markets and solar markets in general growing in that region? Based on that research, we've identified three priority markets, Nigeria, Ghana, and Kenya. Um, and following that, in a second phase, we actually traveled to those markets. We spoke to more than three dozen stakeholders, uh, primarily installers and developers in those markets. And I'm joined today um, by, by the two researchers who've actually done most of the heavy lifting on this project, um, Takehiro Kabahara, as well as Ulime Ezekiel. Um, welcome, guys. Um, the, before we kick off, actually, um, we'll, we'll have a bit of a conversation in the next uh, 25 minutes with, with the two of you. Um, before we kick off, however, um, we wanted to run a quick survey once again um, of the, the audience that is on the call right now and really hear from you where, where, do you, where does the audience think is the CNI solar market headed? Um, so please take a few seconds, click on the statement that you agree with most uh, that you're seeing on the screen right now. And then uh, we'll be looking to forward to see whether that roughly agrees with where we see the market or, or does is not agreeing. And as I said, we'll be looking forward to discuss the findings of the report that has been published today with the key authors, Take and Ulime. Right. Very interesting. So we're seeing uh, roughly a tie between people who are very bullish on the market, but also people who think that time hasn't come yet. Um, so, Take, I, I, I want to start with you. You know, you you've spent a lot of time in the past few months looking really at that question: Why is one in four megawatts of the, the solar market in Africa being sold directly to end customers? Um, what is going on here? Mm -hmm. So there are several reasons for this, and they come from both the supply and the demand side. First of all, first of all let's consider the supply side. So developers have struggled building utility scale solar projects in the region for multiple reasons, such as administrative delays, unbankable PPAs, and difficulties to secure land. As a result, over the past few years, we have seen some developers trying to develop CNI solar projects. For some, this is a primary business model. For others, 
this is still secondary, but it seems that they managed to get deals done faster compared to duty scale. Okay, so th it's it it seems like it might be about um, speed, but but you know the the speed of how quickly you can close a project. I, I would assume that depends to a large extent to to who is buying, who the counterparty is. So who's the demand side for these projects? Yes, exactly. You must also consider the demand side. Is, and there is, is this all, are, are these companies doing it for sustainability purposes? No, the primary factor is actually the economics. If you line up the grid exit tariffs, as you see on this uh, chart, for the commercial customers in the sub-Saharan African region, the tariffs range from 0 0.06 to 0 0.247 US dollar per kilowatt hour. Then if you overlay what the cost of kilowatt hour from solar is here, you see that roughly half the market's solar makes sense economically. So, okay, so, so what, what we're seeing on the slide is, is basically the concept of, of socket parity, right? The idea that if you pencil out the economics, then installing solar on your rooftop is going to be able to get you cheaper electricity than buying it from your utility. But that, that's a concept, you know, here at Bloomberg NEF, we've, we've looked at that concept in a lot of markets, in a lot of ways. And, and really, you know, what we found is that's usually not enough to get a market started. So why has this all of a sudden kicked off in the last two years? Is, 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 what else is going on? Yes, that's right. So the other in, really important point in our view is regulation. For CNI solar projects, this can often be tricky. But in general, CNI solar projects can be relatively easier to navigate in Africa. It is actually the lack of regulation that makes it attractive. There's almost no net metering or feeding tariff policies enacted in the region. So it is impossible to sell power to the grid. That has implications for how a CNI solar installation is designed. Essentially, you must consume all the electricity from solar on site. On the other hand, as long as you put equipment into place that guarantees electricity is not fed into the grid, you can build up to one megawatt without a generation license and without telling the utility. But there are also some challenges outside what is shown here, which we can discuss later. So, so what you're saying, if I understand you correctly, is you know developers like commercial and industrial projects to some extent because they might be smaller but they can sell them faster because they're working with a private counterparty and they can also get them done faster because the regulations are as you said they're designed for consumption of all the electricity on site um, so what we're seeing here on the chart is that in in some depending on the country and below certain thresholds you can build these with much less uh, regulatory oversight. So, but again, that that's sort of the theory we that that we've known for quite a while now. As I said, you guys collected a lot of data um, on on what is going on in the market at the moment during your research. So maybe tell us a bit more. You know, where is the market right now? You're right. So that the fundamental outline of this has been known. What is new is that we are now actually seeing attraction in the market. So please remember that a lot of projects are being done by Rotary, but the data on this chart show, uh, which are collected from the interviewees, show that uh, the market started to kick off in 2016 and 2017, and then accelerated in 2018. So as you see here, uh, the number of projects reached 39 uh, in 2018. And in terms of the installed capacity, uh, installed capacity is reached 35 megawatt uh, in the year. And then developers we interviewed are quite optimistic about uh, the market growth in 2019. And then market is likely to be accelerated um, this year. Okay, so I mean that, you know, let, let's, 
that's a, an, an, a fast trajectory here. We should also keep in mind 35 megawatts per se is not such a large number, um, but a lot of growth, as, as you're saying, and really something that only recently kicked off. Um, who's actually, who are the counterparties for these projects? Is, is it all focused in one sector? How, how does that look? The sectors are quite variable. Um, but one notable sector is actually mining, which is the largest sector by capacity. If you see the left-hand side chart here, because the sites are larger compared to others, the average size of the mining sector, CNI solar project is about six megawatt per site. And other sectors which are active to buy CNI solar are manufacturing companies, public buildings, including schools and hospitals, and offices, those are major customers also. And average project size really varies from 91 kilowatt for horticultural sector to 450 kilowatt for manufacturing sector. So, so what we're seeing uh, to some extent, what comes out of what you just said is there, there are really two sub segments of this, this commercial and industrial solar market. You have the mining sector where we're seeing megawatt scale projects, you said on average six megawatt, and, and maybe we should highlight that is actually just the solar component for these mining projects. Typically we've seen for every megawatt of PV, about three to four megawatt of diesel capacity being installed as well. So those are tens of megawatts uh, of, of, of individual projects. And then that's about half of the capacity, the other half is in in a variety of, of of other sectors as a result of that you know when we look at the map of where across the region actually these projects are we have a few countries that are sort of relatively large within the the, the, the range that we're seeing here such as burkina faso but that is actually a single project um now i remind the audience right i said in the beginning we identified nigeria kenya and ghana as the markets with perhaps you might say the most replicative potential. Um, so, so not just one-off projects. Um, and, and, and I think to some extent that's reflected here. Now out of those countries, um, Nigeria is the largest market here with, with 20 megawatt. Um, and, and, and actually, if I remember, that might be an, even in a relatively conservative estimate. Um, before I go in and, and ask Ulime, who has traveled to, to Nigeria to elaborate a bit about that, I just want to remind the audience that we will have a Q&A session at the end. So if you have any questions on what we're discussing, please type them into the chat. Um, Ulime, let's talk about Nigeria. You know, what, what is it about Nigeria that has allowed it to become the largest CNI solar market at the moment in Sub-Saharan Africa? And I should emphasize this is outside of South Africa itself. Okay, so le let me start off with a, an interesting fact that, that may blow your mind, actually. So in 2016 alone, Nigerians spent a whopping $16 billion to power privately owned diesel and gasoline generators. Now, let me put this into context for you. This is equivalent to the amount that Nigerians spent on powering private generators is equivalent to the GDP of Senegal and or just over a third of the GDP of Ghana. So that's that's how much Nigerians spend on ensuring they don't get power cuts, right? Or they take care of their own power. So to be frank, Nigerians don't typically care about clean energy or if, if the energy is clean or sustainable. They just want depend they just want dependent on self-generation power. Yeah, so so basically what, what I'm trying to say here is that they don't typically care about if the energy is clean or sustainable. They just want stable power. So that's what Nigerians are going for. And most will pay a premium to do so. As you can see, the, the fact that they're spending $16 billion there, you can see that, of course, this is what they want. Um, so hence why many are dependent on self-generation as you can see from the dotted line, the, the dotted um, gray bar on the left, you can see um, today the heavy dependence on diesel and then in the future that should be reduced. 
So now the 2030 energy target shows that the government, as you can see from the chart, is committed to reducing the dependence on self-generation by 60%. So it's good to know the government's on board there. So you asked why CNI? So Nigerians are, experience very frequent and unpredictable power outages on a daily basis. I'm talking about this can last from four to 15 hours per day, per day um, across the country. And this is pretty much a breeding ground for CNI solar development. So it's those very frequent outages, long outages, that brings on CNI solar development, commercial and industrial solar. So, you know, that that's, that's of course, a huge number. Um, and, you, you know, both numbers, actually, the, the, the vast amount of money that is being spent on, on diesel fuel, as well as really the, the, you know, the extent to which the country relies on those private generators. But elaborate a bit for us, you know, how, how is that a good thing for solar? So as a, CNI, as a commercial industrial solar developer, you're essentially competing with expensive diesel electricity, which is not easy to beat because if you look at the green um, bar at the bottom there, you're seeing 28 to 32 cent, um, US cent per kilowatt hour, which is extremely high, even when compared to a system that is using PV, solar panels and batteries. So it's still cheaper to use solar and, and batteries than to use diesel gensets. Most developers offer an on-site solar hybrid solution, which basically integrates four sources of power. So in Nigeria, what you're seeing, people are using a mixture of solar panels, plus batteries for storage, plus diesel generators, plus grid. All of this is combined to ensure a stable power supply uh, load, shall I say. So and, and, essentially what, develop, so what developers are doing is they're selling a service where they typically manage your existing diesel generator. So you have an existing generator and you have a grid connection already, but the grid's not reliable. So you use your diesel. So what they're doing is they're adding solar and storage to sort of stabilize that. Um, so, so again, really, yeah, so go ahead. So, so really, if you're a, a, a CNI solar vendor in Nigeria, you're not just offering solar panels. You're not just offering to install the solar panels, but you're, committing in your contract to a certain level of or, or to reliable electricity and you manage all the sources of electricity for the customer is that about right yes yeah, so this solar hybrids business model being used in nigeria at the moment which is different to the other markets allows developers to guarantee no power cuts for at least 98 percent of the year and as i mentioned before nigerians are willing to pay a premium which is obviously less than the diesel that they're paying already, they're willing to pay for no power cuts. So that's what this gives them that business model. No, okay. Now, Take, um, I know you, you went to Ghana um, and Ghana had, had a, a very well-documented power crisis as well a few years ago. Is, is, it, is it the same driver in Ghana? Is it the same you know, market dynamics that you've seen there? No, this is different. Um, Ghana had a power crisis a few years ago. It has mostly served this, but by driving SSC prices up significantly. Recently, recently, the power prices have declined by the government, but solar remains competitive still economically. Many projects installed in Ghana are commercial projects so far, including public buildings and other uh, distributed infrastructure. But there is also traction in the manufacturing sector. The heaviest power consumers in Ghana are the manufacturing sector, and there are about 47 companies which are registered as bulk customers. And also, we also need to mention that there's another potential customer, which is extractive industry, which is dominated by gold miners. And it accounts for about 10% of the total power consumption in the country. So, so we're back to mining as well as a as a potential large customer for this. Um, now, I, I think what we're seeing from the chart is, you know, in in Ghana because of that power crisis and the sort of emergency purchases of of uh, fossil-based power generation capacity, Ghana has had a pretty high electricity tariff 
So what we can see from the chart in Ghana, uh, the, the, the cost of solar power has actually been below the grid tariff for quite for a few years. Now, the other country that you traveled to was Kenya. And in Kenya, you know, we, we've seen the market, uh, we, we've seen the market accelerate, but the, the economic ter the, the economic um, break-even point here, as we see on the chart in Kenya, has occurred far more recently. Um, so, so the market has had less time to get used to, to the new economic reality. Um, is that affecting the market? Well, what is driving the market in Kenya? So Kenya, likewise Ghana, the economics is the primary driver for solar. Um, so consumers are interested in uh, cost saving by using solar. And then even though SSC great, great SSC tariffs are lower compared to Ghana, as you see in the chart. But another important thing is um, Kenya is the largest economy in East Africa. And the regulatory environment is relatively friendly for foreign companies. So many companies try to start uh, a solar business from Kenya, even though they aim at expanding business outside of Kenya eventually. And in the country, we identified 15 projects for manufacturers and seven for horticulture. And these sectors are seen attractive because they have stable and high power demand operate six or seven days per week. As you see, some of the examples are in this chart, which is the uh, landscape of different actors in a CNSI solar space. So, OK, so so now, you know, I want to emphasize you you guys, when you traveled, you, you spoke to a large number of the, the companies that we're seeing on the chart here. and and a number of others as well. Um, and, and the picture you painted in the conversation so far is, you know, very good fundamentals, accelerating market, uh, promising, promising business model. Uh, now, but you know, let's also not forget the reality. These are tough markets to operate in to, to begin with, uh, to, to various degrees, of course. And, you know, the market is new and despite a lot of promise in the past so it, it can't all be that rosy from your conversations with all those people who are who are really living the market day in and day out what are the primary things that keep them awake what what is making their life hard so the common thing common challenge between kenya and ghana is customer awareness um so cna solar companies as you see some of the local international developers, EPC companies uh, in this diagram, have, a, have made a lot of efforts to convince uh, potential, cons potential customers to understand benefits and reliability of benefits of the uh, solar. And uh, thanks to that, um, the sales cycle has, has been shortened dramatically in the last couple of years. But uh, still, um, the developers that we talked to mentioned that the customer awareness is still a challenge um, underway, and it needs to be overcome in order to grow the market even more. To cut in for one minute, we have some questions really relevant to this slide. Just I think this will get everyone back on board. Um, we need to know what EPC stands for, and also a question about um, what does off-takers mean? Okay, so EPC stands for uh, engineering, program, and uh, construction companies, um, which is primarily in charge of uh, um, exterior construction, civil construction, and installations. And off-taker means that actually, but the customers, CNI solar customers who use uh, solar equipment um, or buy electricity uh, from solar through PPA or use the leasing service. All the C9 solar. So we we use a single term of off taker here uh, to include all the type of customers. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so we're we're hearing that the, the question, you know, potential customers on paper could save, but they don't know it and they don't trust the technology. The the the, the, the sort of the the technology doesn't have the right image. Um, 
Ulime in Nigeria seems to be a bit more of a, you know, if I may say, mature market, purely in the sense that, that people might have seen it more frequently. Is it the same challenges? Are there other challenges that you've encountered in, in your conversations? In Nigeria, I wouldn't say that customer awareness is an issue because since we're using storage now, so we're using hybrid systems and not just solar panels, people now believe in solar. Previously, Nigerians will say solar doesn't work, but now Nigerians know solar works. They can see it working. They can see that there's people that have solar don't have power cuts. So it's, it's something that has come up. So th the main issue in Nigeria, there's one real issue actually, which is actually the lack of affordable financing. And essentially what that means is that there's also no project financing, right? So project financing, I'll, I'll quickly define that, is when you, in most developed markets, you can take out debt on a predictable 20 year cash flow period. So as long as it's predictable, the bank will lend on that. However, that's not available in Nigeria. Only asset financing is available where a physical asset or collateral is required to secure a loan. Now, typically lenders want real estate as collateral and they do not accept the solar equipment as, as um, collateral. So that's, that's definitely an issue because it means you need to own land and not everybody owns real estate in Nigeria and a developer may be able to buy equipment, but they may not, may not be able to show land that, they, that has that value. And also there's a lack of lenders. So as you can see from this diagram, it's quite interesting to see that there's only one lender there, right? We specifically put one there because there's only one that's really active. And only the Bank of Industry, which is a development bank in Nigeria, is offering single digit debt financing advertised at 9% per year over a five year period. Um, it's new, they've, got a, they've launched a new 6 billion Naira fund, which is equivalent to $16.8 million, which was commissioned in 2018. <laughs> okay, so local commercial banks, on the other hand, are pretty much non-existent in, non -existent in the space since they're offering rates of over 25%, some even go into 30%. So, I mean, you think about in the West, we're looking at rates are almost 0% on loans, but here in, in Nigeria, you're looking at local banks of 20 odd percent, 25%, with Bank of Industry is offering 9%, which is good. So that's, so the financing bottleneck is really important to understand in Nigeria. What lenders say is if they know the business works, they know they can make money, all they need is the financing. So that is the main bottleneck. Now, there's two other things actually in Nigeria to also take into account, currency fluctuation risks. So I'll quickly say that almost 90% of Nigeria's exports is still from oil. So in 2014, when the oil price crashed, the Naira depreciated some 41% in one year. Now, this is a risk that concerns foreign investors, specifically if you're taking on US dollar financing or if you're investing in pounds or investing in dollars. If the Naira dropped 40% in a few years, then you're going to be worried because you still need to pay back the dollar loan that you've taken out. So that's, that's another issue. Some hedging instruments exist to prevent this, but no developments, developers have taken them up yet since high financing rates is still an issue. Now, the final thing is actually currency curve convertibility. So as you'll understand, if you're operating these big assets, we're looking at potentially million dollar investments, meaning that you're gonna see some fairly big revenues coming in. Now, the issue is if you're getting your revenue in Nigerian Naira, <clears throat> the central bank usually restricts the amount of US dollars that can leave the country, meaning that when it comes to actually converting that Naira, to dollars in order to pay back your lender, for example, whether it's an equity lender or, or a debt lender, you may have an issue because the exchange rate may have changed and you may not be able to get the dollars in order to pay that back. And again, the currency could drop. So I would say financing and the fact that currency fluctuates potentially and currency convertibility. But I would also, I would also know one thing here actually, Niger the Nigerian Naira has been stable since the 1990s. It's only recent when the oil price crashed in 2014 that this happened. So it's, it was really unpredictable. That, that's, that's really useful. Thanks for unpacking the, the, the different financial risks here. Because I think often uh, in, in the conversations that I've been part of, uh, 
a lot of the developers say, you know, the lack of debt financing is is among the biggest, if not the biggest hurdle. Um, I think I want to emphasize again, the most, most assets so far have been built either with equity financing from the, the developer or the installer um, or as direct sales. So basically just selling the equipment to the end customer. Um, so again, but but this this lack of financing, of course, it can break that down into different uh, areas, either the cost or lack of suitable tenors. Um, and what we also seen, and we, we elaborated a bit on that in the report, is despite you know, still very limited funding, we have seen a number of deals and a number of facilities being set up over the course of the last year, um, including, uh, we should mention, from responsibility, um, but also from others. Um, <clears throat> now, one last thing that I want to touch upon, you know, is, is, is the regulatory framework. Uh, so to, to some extent, you know, we said it's easier, there's potentially less red tape, um, but I think the other thing that's happening in the regulatory framework is it hasn't actually been designed in, in almost none of these markets. The regulatory framework for solar has been designed for CNI solar. Um, in most markets, it's been defined for either utility scale power plants that sell electricity to the grid operator um, or perhaps for sort of solar for energy access in rural villages um so in many ways what came out of the report is you know that some of these projects are entering uncharted territory from a regulatory point of view now how how is that affecting the you know the development process Take, what what have you found so we asked the developers and other organizations what kind of regulatory reform they want to have and there were there were answers different answers from 29 respondents out of the 36 companies organizations and the majority uh, the many organizations in nigeria answered enforcing import duty and what exemption for solar equipment and also in ghana and kenya um 10 organizations answered net metering which which has been discussed for many several years in those two countries, but it's it's quite un unclear when and how it's going to be implemented. But uh, they are interested in because it has a potential driver of the market. And then um, two things two things which are important outside of this chart are one is how is how a regulator allows uh, CNI solar companies to sell electricity um, and then there's a limitation on the ability to sell electricity irrespective of whether it is produced on site or sold via the distribution grid and it can be a hurdle if an asset is located at the customer site but owned by a separate electricity service company and another one is the licensing a general licensing um, in kenya and ghana um, it is possible to acquire a permit or license uh, to do the generation project, but sometimes, depending on the countries, sometimes to go through all the application process is quite cumbersome, which means that a developer needs to collect a lot of documentations and takes a lot of time. And also, regulator may not may not go through all the process. On, uh, in line with the timeline which they stipulate so it's quite it's sometimes untransparent and unpredictable which is a one of the hurdles in the regulatory environment so and, and is that something that is really holding companies back from developing projects or is that sort of an a nuisance but but it it, it still you know allows projects to go ahead I, th I think the, you know, what, what we've seen is from, from the questions is an, a number of these, these developers will see some of these challenges, but again, the, the response is typically that companies are adjusting 
the way that they do projects or finding ways to structure projects in a way that is both compliant within that that sort of uncharted regulatory territory um, but still goes ahead with projects um, now maybe before we wrap up you know what what are your thoughts what are your conclusions in terms of where's this market going to go in the next year or two um, you, you know you mentioned that a lot of the developers are quite uh, optimistic where where does that take us so overall it's optimistic um so we collected the, some data from the the companies um in terms of pipeline in the next couple of years and uh, that, that pipeline for 2019 indicates the market could be roughly doubled of the current size and actually ghana could take the crown as you see in these diagrams but in the midterm it is important to recognize that each country's market might be very small which is simply because the power market per side is limited. So the message here is it's important to consider the portfolio of different projects at the multiple sides in order to scale the market overall. So we're seeing probably, uh, you know, Nigeria is bound to potentially remain the largest market, but, but Ghana catching up uh, quite fast as well in terms of the pipeline and really a growing pipeline in terms of year on year installations uh, everywhere um or, or at least in the three markets that we looked at in detail um now we i think we have a lot of questions that came in uh from the audience um which we'll, we'll be looking forward to discuss in a second i'll just remind everyone as well you know the report uh, and with some of the underlying data and the much deeper discussion of the issues that we've touched upon on a high level here is uh, live uh, you can see the link uh, where you can download the whole report here uh, so please feel free to do that um, at the same time as well before we kick into the conversation with the audience um, we wanted to run another quick survey here and really identify what the audience thinks the main bottlenecks are. So please, again, take a few seconds, click on the, on the statement that you agree with most in terms of what is holding back the market. Um, we'll give it a few seconds for, for the answers to roll in. Um, and, and in the meantime, Stacy, please, I'll refer to you. Um, you've collated some of the questions. Um, and I'll hand over for you to moderate the Q&A. Yes, we have quite a few questions, so we'll get to as many as we can. And if we don't get to all of them, we'll send out um, some answers to, the, to the, everyone who attended today to the questions we did not get to. Um, so I'll start with this question. Um, it sounds like a key issue is the raising of debt. Uh, does this mean that there is sufficient equity capital in the market already? So it... I'll talk about Nigeria specifically here. So in Nigeria, what you're seeing at the moment is pretty much all the projects, most of the projects now, specifically commercial and industrial solar, are equity financed. Essentially what I said before, the debt, the debt rate's too high. So if you're trying to get a loan out on, let's think about a mortgage for your house. If you're in the UK, you want to take a mortgage out, you're looking at maybe 2% interest rate per year. Even the Bank of Industry can't compete with that, even though they're offering 9%, which is good. 9% is good, but it's not as close as the 2% that you can get over here, right? And if you're going to a commercial bank to get a loan for a business, you're talking 27% or 30%. So it basically eats into, so if you take out a loan in Nigeria, you're essentially eating all the capital, so all your profit away, just by paying um, the financing fees. So you have to just look at it that, it's a good thing that the Bank of Industry has issued this 6 billion Naira loan, which is, again, $16.5 million. But again, they've not yet dispersed any funds and their lending criteria is pretty strict. Um, but they, what they say is that they've essentially approved all the projects for the 6 billion Naira loan and they expect to see some projects being built and they're going to disperse the funds. And the thing to note on a Bank of Industry loan is each, project, each um, end user or each developer that wants to take out a loan can take out a 350 million Naira loan out of that 6 billion Naira loan um, fund, shall I say. I think um, 
there's a, I mean, in general, in the financing, it's a uh, challenge is not only just the lending side, but also uh, the cost combination of the customer side and also um, CNS or players as well. And for, from the financiers' perspective, um, especially large financiers, um, they seek for larger projects and more projects. But so far, for example, in the countries like Ghana, uh, most of the projects are done one by one. And each project size is relatively small, as, you, as we have seen. And um, at the moment, we, we don't see much cases that are collecting a lot of projects as a portfolio, which probably larger financing want to have. Uh, to be active more for the financing. So that's uh, one challenge. And also that's also related to how customer awareness situation can improve. Um, right. So just a reminder to everyone, um, on the on the right-hand side of the screen under handouts, you can download the report. Apparently the link might not be working in the actual webinar, but please download the report from the right-hand side of the screen in handouts instead. Um, Next, another question that I have is, um, what options are available for taking international loans in local currencies? Can anyone feel that? Um, we haven't seen, we haven't seen um, international loans, uh, sorry, international uh, loans in the local currency yet. The local currency financing we have seen are quite limited cases, but in Kenyan case, um, there are exam there's an example that um, a few local banks are becoming active to finance CNI Solar um, through the program called Sunlight Program, uh, which is supported by a French development organization. And one of the company, one of the local banks said that uh, they have financed uh, seven projects so far. Um, we cannot name here, but uh, even though there is no support from the, um, the French government uh, through the SANEF program, uh, they were mentioning that uh, they are positive to do the fi financing in local currency with an interest rate of uh, one, 12, one, 11 to 12 percent because this financier has seen that the CNI solar market is having traction in Kenya market. I, I'd say for CNI Solar, for commercial and industrial solar, I haven't seen. There's no at the moment. There's no international loans in Nigeria. The only place where it seems that the international lenders that the, um, are, are comfortable lending to essentially is on grid project um, solar projects in Nigeria because they have the backing of the government where they sign a PPA and they denominate in dollars, and then they have something called a PCOA, which basically ensures that they get their money back. So you're basically in Nigeria, what you really need is Naira debt, but you need cheap Naira debt. And if there's going to be international loans, are going to, there's possibly going to have to be some hedging involved that you can show the lenders. If you can show them that, then they may bring it in, but we've, we've not seen any at the moment. It's, it's mainly equity. Okay, another question. Uh, what is the role of mini grids in the CNI market in Nigeria? So that's an interesting question because what you see is, for example, the REA are running an, eco an economic clusters program where they try to identify economic clusters. And what they would do is possibly if you want to develop a mini grid for, say, some small shops in a, that are clustered together in an area, they can fall under the mini grid regulation. So the good thing is, one, one good thing about Nigeria is there is a mini grid regulation which covers projects from 100 kilowatts to one megawatt. That's what the reg regulation covers. So we haven't seen much of the, the commercial and industrial players doing that at the moment. Mostly they're just installing captive power and doing on-site, again, captive power, which is on-site generation. So that's what we're seeing at the moment. When we've seen that there are a lot of mini grids, but it's mainly for communities, residential, and so on. I, I, I would maybe de yeah. I would maybe deconstruct that question a little bit. So you you can argue, you know, there, there is the technical element of of a microgrid, which is the the mixing of different generation technologies, and that is what what as Ulime said earlier is almost a standard practice in Nigeria 
Um, so most most solar vendors will offer solar directly bundled both economically but also on the technical level with battery storage with uh, diesel generators as well as with a grid um, so on a technical level that qualifies as a microgrid but there's only a single buyer for the electricity um, the other approach that you can think of but that is really far rarer is that somebody could basically build a, a solar powered micro utility and sell to several businesses around them. Um, I think we've seen that less. A bunch of the attraction in the CNI business model is really that you can directly close a deal with an individual company and, and, and therefore have it, you know, have the revenue stream um, locked in with, with the appropriate risks, of course. Okay, let's see, there's so many questions. Here's a very specific one. Um, are any of the EPC contractors from China? Um, specifically, I, I haven't seen any specific Chinese, China-based companies active in sin and solar market as EPC. Um, Chinese companies are more active in terms of uh, supplying equipment. Um, of course, the SPB modules are mo mostly uh, come from China or other Chinese companies manufact uh, manufacturing sites uh, outside of China, and also um, inverters as well, at least in the Kenya and Ghana market. Okay, here's another question focusing on Nigeria. How are the equity investors hedging themselves in Nigeria? So at the moment, that's, that, again, that's a good question. They're not really hedging themselves. So what's happening is we've, we've had some developers saying that the, the thing about Nigeria is you just have to be comfortable doing business in Naira. And it's, 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 a, really important, it's a really important point to make because what these guys are doing, like for example, what some guys are doing is they're not taking that specific instruments. What they'll do is say, okay, if the Naira has depreciated, we'll just up our prices for new installations. So it's not really an official hedge, but it's essentially saying we're just going to charge more for a, for a new installation. That that's the, the closest I've seen to any sort of hedging, but it's not really hedging, should I say? So I would say that they're just adjusting their prices, shall things change. The good thing is because solar has become so cheap, they can get away with doing that. Previously, they couldn't. Good. So um, next question, what is the distribution of the scale of projects that were looked at in terms of size? Distribution of the... No, sorry. The scale of the projects um, in terms of size. Uh-huh. So that that varies quite a lot, um, and then there are many single below 100 kilowatt projects. Um, but, money, for example, but if you look at the manufacturing sector specifically, the scale is a little bit bigger. As I mentioned, um, the average size is 450 kilowatt. We have seen some um, nearly one megawatt uh, project as well, but it's. It's not always because of the power demand. It's, all, it's also because of the some uh, uh, land availability or rooftop availability as well, and um, and also so I think partially affected. Partially, it is affected by the regulation because in some countries, um, below one megawatt is relatively easier in terms of licensing or permit. Uh, for example, in Kenya, if you go up beyond the one megawatt, um, you need to acquire a permit. Uh, for generation by the regulator, and then beyond three megawatt, you need a license. Okay, and last question um, about the the Ghana market again. Uh, given the projected volatility in the Ghana SETI, am I pronouncing that right? In 2019, um, will that affect the CNI traction? Yes, I think so. Um, especially current trend is Ghana Ghana SETI is uh, getting weaker and weaker over a few years. And that means that, for example, if if a company is relying on diesel gener generator significantly, that means it it makes them to more it makes them to pay more to buy 
um, diesel fuels uh, from because it's mostly imported, and also um, and also uh, if you if a company uses uh, on-site solar, that is a that is one way to hedge and uh, the change of the electricity prices as well because the Ghana has quite a lot of thermal generation which is using uh, fossil fuel as well. So the weaker weaker Ghanaian city would affect the economics of the uh, cost generation cost, which is eventually affect on the electricity price as well. Even though the government has declined electricity prices uh, politically, but uh, that is not cost cost effective at the moment. Okay, so we'll wrap up there. We still have a lot of unanswered questions, and we'll try to get answers out to all of you um, in the next week or so. Uh, uh, in the meantime, thank you for attending. You can visit all of our websites, check out the right-hand side of the screen in the chat section. You can find all kinds of information there. Um, the report is there. Again, thank you for attending and feel free to contact any of us at any time. Um, we'd love to hear from you. Have a wonderful day. Bye.